This is the second of our Live in the Field Facebook events. My name's Carol Garrison. I'm one of the educators here at the Wetland Center. And I am really excited today to be able to take everybody on a virtual walk. I've led quite a few tours here at the Wetland Center, but this particular pond trail, I haven't had a lot of opportunity, so I'm thrilled to get to share it with all of you on this very beautiful, however very windy day. I am standing in the middle of an 84 inch piece of pipe and you're probably wondering why I would be standing in this giant piece of pipe. This is a slice, an example, of the 43 mile pipeline that connects the southern end of the wetland center with the northern aspect of Lake Lavon. This is a man-made wetland center and it is built for the purpose of cleaning municipal water. After these fantastic um, aqua aquatic plants clean the water, that cleaned water is then transported via this 43-mile pipe underground through Kaufman and Collin counties um, where it is deposited in Lake Lavon where it can be further cleaned for um, public use by the Wiley Treatment Center. Now, I didn't have this particular stop first for us to go see, but I was quite lucky. One of our other educators told me that a kill deer had put a nest right in our parking lot. So why don't we go head over there and go take a look at a kill deer nest? As you're about to see, kill deer don't exactly do a lot of engineering when it comes to building their nests. They simply find a shallow depression in some rocks and they lay their eggs there. I've got my handy dandy stick right here to point out. I haven't seen the adult killed deer, so I'm going to point real quick to the eggs. You can see how easily they could be mistaken for rocks. There they are. We've got a red flag to make sure that nobody gets into this nest. Adult killdeer have a really unique adaptation to protect their nest. They'll feign having a broken wing to distract predators so that the predators will chase the injured adult rather than focusing their attention on the nest. Now we don't want to bother this nest too much, so we're going to go ahead and head away from the nest, let that killdeer adult, which is mostly over there in the front yard of the center, and we're going to head away and give them some peace and quiet. We're going to head back over into our yard to look at one more piece of equipment that belongs to the North Texas Municipal Water District. And as you can see in our yard, there's lots of spots of yellow. So let's stop real quick and take a look at these adorable yellow flowers and identify them. <clears throat> these are southern dandelions, a fantastic food source for overwintering and early spring pollinators. Dandelions are completely edible and make quite a tasty tea. If you're interested in getting into some flower pressing, I highly recommend that you start with the dandelion. They're plentiful and they, and they dry quite easily. We'll hopefully see a couple more dandelions that have some bees on them. We saw several when we first got here. So we'll keep looking at these dandelions as we head over to our next point of interest. My cameraman knows that to the right we've got an adorable bee that is just doing some fantastic pollinating on that dandelion right there as, he, as she flies away. Oh, now she's going to go over to this one. Live filming is always adventurous. You can't exactly ask the wildlife to stop and pose for you, but bees are such an accommodating species that they don't mind being photographed. Well, let's head on over to this interesting contraption that looks like a moon lander in the front yard of the wetland center. This is the weather station that is owned and operated by the North Texas Municipal Water District. This particular station measures temperature, wind speed, humidity, and barometric pressure. And they use this information to take into account when they are assessing the water and their evaporation rates. Now we're going to go past the water, the water, the weather station, and we're going to head on to Martin Lane. And we've got some beautiful white birds that have landed in the field right across the street from us. I'll give anybody a few seconds to try to guess what they think they are. I'll give you a hint. They really like to hang out around cattle. 
that's correct. These are cattle egrets. Cattle egrets and have a very good relationship with cattle. They tend to to go through all of the waste of the cattle and they look for all sorts of little bits of nutrition inside them. Now while you're looking at these cattle egrets, you have realized that there looks like to be some sort of ranch or farm across the street from the wetland center. This is Woes Rosewood Ranch. It is a working cattle ranch and you can see the beautiful cattle over to the right. I didn't see the cattle here yesterday, so I'm pretty excited to not only have a virtual crowd going on this walk with me, but now those beautiful cows are clearly have taken interest in us and they're going to be following along, I think. Well, let's head down Martin Lane. and do a bit of wildflower examination because if you love yellow wildflowers, Texas is the place for you to hang out in spring. Now one of our egrets decided to give us a nice flyby. So we've talked about that one dandelion. Let's go talk about another dandelion. All right, so let's take a look at this one here. As you can see, much taller than that southern dandelion. This is what's called a false dandelion, also known as a Texas dandelion. Not all the states get their own dandelion, but the state of Texas sure does. And now just in case you're wanting to identify even more yellow flowers, right here we're seeing some adorable flowers with these bright, shiny five yellow petals. This is called buttercup. I'm in the family Ranunculus. Common name is little frogs, and you're probably wondering why someone would name a cute yellow flower like this a little frog. The buttercups tend to hang out along creeks and riversides where you see little frogs. So they, uh, they got a name because they tend to hang out in areas that frogs inhabit. Now, right to the left of us here, you're seeing a small orchard. The, the Rosewood Ranch does have the Sands family that is adding to their orchard here. They planted some of these peaches and plums in the past years, and it's their plan to expand this orchard. And uh, one of these days when we take a tour, I expect to see a full orchard all the way down Martin Lane. you a really nice view of the southern section of the wetland. We're not going to be going on the southern section today, but once the, wet, once the center is open, I truly invite everybody to come and spend a pleasant, pleasant day walking on the boardwalk and enjoying all the sights that you can see on the boardwalk. We're going to keep heading down Martin Lane. I've seen a good variety of Phoebes. I've seen some Robins this morning. And obviously we've got some good um, Gilder. Just as we pulled up, we get to see a beautiful red-tailed hawk. So I'm hoping another one of those decides to, uh, to give a little bit of a presence later this morning. Now, we've talked a lot about yellow flowers. How about we go into the other end of the color spectrum? Because I'm seeing some beautiful color over here on the left. So let's take a look at this beautiful native Texas wildflower. The flower has a much of a cup shape, I would say. And wouldn't you say, agree with me, that that's the color of wine? Well, then it's not a coincidence that the name of this flower is a wine cup. Wine cups have um, one of, they're one of my favorite wildflowers for this reason. They bloom for over two weeks. They open up every morning with the sun, and as the sun goes down, they close up. And you can see, like, this one's just starting to open. This one over here was completely closed up when we first got here about an hour and a half ago. I bet these will be completely opened up when we're done with our walk. As you can see, we've got these few here, but look at this larger field here. It's 
It's one of the things I love about Texas wildflowers is how beautiful they seem to all match together. So now you should be able to, to recognize that we've also got some of our Texas false dandelions mixed in with these beautiful wine cups. Well, we're going to head back out onto the road. I know this is a, a pleasurable walk, but I can't help but uh, squeezing in a few vocabulary words. If you've been on a walk with me before, you know you're going to leave with some vocabulary. So we're going to talk about one of my favorite words, which is ecotone. An ecotone is an overlap of different habitats. And on this particular walk that you've decided to join me on this morning, we're going to have not one, not two, but three different habitats. We've already seen um, the wetland to the, to the south of us. We've already taken a look at over to the left where we've got Blackland Prairie. And later this morning, we're going to be heading into a bottomland hardwood forest. When you have an overlap of uh, habitats like that, it's called an ecotone. And the main benefits to the ecotone is that it has a great increase of biodiversity because different creatures get their needs of their habitat, which is food, shelter, and water, from those different habitats. When you have them overlapping, it means that that habitat overlap can serve a greater number of creatures. Now, Daniel is panning over to past that large structure that you see ahead of me, that is the pump station. And that is where that 43 mile long pipe that I was in at the beginning, that is where that pipe starts, travels underground, that 43 miles all the way to Lake Levon. the left we've got ourselves some big beautiful trees does anybody know what those are I'll give you a hint they may produce a nut that you really enjoy eating pies made out of at Thanksgiving that's correct these are pecan trees these pecan these pecan trees have been on the property <clears throat> for a considerably long amount of time some of the pecan trees that were on the property were lost when they flooded this area for the wetland because pecan trees do not like to have waterlogged roots. Did you know that the pecan is the only major tree nut that's native to the United States? The word pecan has a Native American Indian origin of Algonquin um, nature, and it is Algonquin for the word stone that requires a nut to crack it. We'll talk a little bit about more pecans as we go down the road because these aren't the only two beautiful pecan trees that we're going to see. As we head down this road, I thought I'd give you a little bit of information about the Rosewood Ranch. The Hunt family began buying property here in Kaufman County in the 1960s, and so they have had a variety of crops and primarily ranching in this area now for quite a long while. Now remember we talked about ecotone and that that means we get a greater biodiversity of wildlife and plants. Well on this particular road we're about to see some signs of a few species of animals. So I'm going to give everybody a chance to identify them. Up here on the right we've got our first example. All right, I'll use my, my stick to point these out. So. Looks like some creature with hooves. We've got one small print here, and then over to the right, quite a bit of a different style print. You know, the only reason this print is quite different is because in this particular road, the water stands here, so this was much softer mud for that animal to sink in. Now, this particular animal is invasive in this area, and we hear the word invasive a lot, so I'd like to give you a definition for it. A creature is considered invasive when it does harm to an environment that it is not native to. And this is an, a non-native invasive creature. This is a footprint or a track of a feral hog. All right, well, let's head further on down the road because with the rain that we've had, there are several other tracks 
also tracks from the water district that came through here. So I was really worried that if they came through last night, they might, might cover up some of the tracks. And let's take a look at a different set of tracks. All right. So let's look at these tracks. Now, pretty nice smooth track. And notice we're seeing right here and right here, those are clear claw indentations. So are you thinking this might be a bobcat? Are you thinking this might be a coyote? And how do you tell the difference? Well, I already know that this could not be a bobcat track because I see those claws. Domestic cats, the mid-sized cats like a bobcat or your great cats like your tigers and your lions, they all have the ability to retract their claws when they are walking. So you're not gonna see their claw prints. So since I'm seeing the claw prints right here, I know that this is most likely coyote. Now, rather than say that this is most likely coyote, I'm gonna tell you it's definitely coyote because I was here a couple of days ago practicing and the coyote and I had ourselves an interaction right on this road when it was muddy and I watched that creature make those tracks on the road. So we've talked about a native creature like the coyote and an invasive non-native creature. I'm afraid to tell you I'm going to introduce you to a non-native invasive species that I happen to love and that is the musk thistle. Uh, musk thistles are native to Scotland. They're actually I believe the national flower for Scotland. Now I just learned from some friends yesterday of how you can tell quickly at a thistle that it is native or not. Native Texas thistles do not have these spines going up the stems. So since I'm seeing these heavy duty spines going all the way up, that does confirm this is not a native thistle. Thistles were brought to the United States about 90 years ago on purpose, and they are considered a noxious weed. You can see the musk thistle produces thousands of seed heads, so they spread rapidly, and their roots are very hard to get out of the ground. And I was talking to someone who said that you have to dredge a hole three times the length of the stem to try to get all of the root out. So they are quite a difficult plant to get hold of. Now, I am noticing another flower that we're gonna look at. And remember I told you, you were gonna see a lot of yellow flowers and I wasn't joking. So let's take a look at this. This right here, and I know with the wind, it might be a challenge to see. That is a bolted wild mustard. Excellent plant for um, attracting pollinators and can also be used in a variety of edible and medicinal purposes. This plant is already bolted, it's already sent up its flower head, and once it sends up the flower head, a lot of the medicinal properties decrease because the energy has gone into producing flowers rather than maintaining the nutritional structure within the plant itself. All right, well, let's head over here when we first got here, we were practicing and we saw some turtles. So I'm really hoping we find another turtle in this overflow ditch. Well, I'm seeing some water beetles swimming around, but I'm not seeing any turtles. Daniel, how about we go to the other side? Maybe we'll be lucky. And it was a pretty good side red eared uh, slider. So I'm gonna hope that, that that turtle has come back over here. But just walking over here, we scared him away last time. Um, Alas, no turtles. However, um, this particular area is a frequent habitat for turtles and crawfish, especially once the water gets warm. I've seen some really large crawfish in here, so I do invite you to make sure during your visits to the Wetland Center that you come down here to this area if you like seeing crawfish. Well, let's head on down Martin Lane. We're going to stop right here for a little bit because there are a few really interesting things to look at. To the left, we have the lagoon. And if you look all the way at the end of the lagoon, you'll see that pass through for the water. The water is in this lagoon. It naturally moves from one part from the central section to the southern section just by the grade of the land. And as we get over here to the southern end of the lagoon, you're going to see two interesting looking structures. These structures 
are called weirs, and they are the gates that control the flow of the water from one area of the wetland to the other. <clears throat> Rather than a gate that you lift up and have the water flow underneath, weirs are manually pushed down and the water flows up over, to, over, the, over the structure so that you don't have the silt or any of the dissolved solids going from one area to the next. So now that we've taken a look at the weirs in the lagoon, we're going to turn around to the other side of the road and we're going to take a look at the water monitoring station. <clears throat> this station, again, is owned and operated by the North Texas Municipal Water District. It has two purposes. On the, on the two readouts you can see, it is measuring the rate of, of water flow in gallons, um, real time, and reporting that information back to the water treatment plant in Wiley. The other measuring that it's doing is it's measuring an accumulated um, quantity of gallons flowing over a 24-hour period. Ah, Daniel, has, his eye has caught another beautiful field of wildflowers, so we'll stop and talk about these real quick. These beautiful flowers are called pink ladies. Um, they are primrose, but a common name is often the buttercup. Now remember, we've already learned about the buttercup ranunculus. These flowers, and I grew up calling them buttercups as a kiddo also, the reason why they are called buttercups is they produce profuse amounts of pollen. And that pink cup fills up with all of that pollen and looks like a cup of butter. As we hit down the road, I was, I was quite happy to find this little patch of white clover. So we're going to come over here and talk about white clover for just a moment. White clover is a, is a truly beneficial plant to any habitat. It is considered a great living mulch. And oftentimes in large scale agricultural operations, they will put rows of white clover in between their actual money crop to help act as a erosion protection and to fix nitrogen from the air to enhance the soil quality. Now a challenge for Daniel right now is going to be that, that there is a blue damselfly to his left that's buzzing around on these grasses over here. Oh, and he's got one that's on the grass in front of him I'm guessing. Excellent. It's, that's a challenge to catch damselflies because they are hard to see. Ah, you've got the damselfly. As you can see, there is a dam, there's a, there's a, it's a common bluet. It's a beautiful example. A lot of times people will think that they are baby dragonflies. And damselflies are a completely separate species. You can really tell the difference. They have a much skinnier, narrow body. And when they rest upon something, they don't have their wings out to the side. They tuck their wings back along the line of their body. Makes them much harder to be seen by predators. Good eye on seeing that common bluet, Daniel. Oh, absolutely, and we're, we're walking. I, I hear there's a question about the Eagle's um, Tower. I definitely, um, on the way back, I'll make sure that we point out the Eagle Tower. Where we're standing right here, I can't see it. But um, thank you for reminding me. We'll make sure that we head back and that we show you the Eagle Tower. Might make the live event a little bit longer because I was planning to end it at the, um, at the trail, but I certainly don't mind coming back and showing you that Eagle Tower. you see to our right is a hay field. Although this is property that's owned by the water district, they do um, grant permission to Rosewood Ranch to bale the hay. And that hay there is, is going to end up being food for those beautiful cows that uh, were visiting with us earlier on the trail. 
Now, as we head around, you're going to see some large equipment. You may be wondering if there's some major construction going on. This is just the staging area for the water district. They keep all of their equipment and their spare rock here. They are responsible for the maintenance and care of the roads that we are walking on right now. And so they just have their equipment here for when they need to conduct those repairs. We're actually going to walk in between all of this equipment and we're going to be heading to another one of those beautiful pecan trees up there. First of all, to get a bit of shade because it's pretty warm. And we're going to talk about that structure to the left because I'm sure all of you have noticed there is a large silo. So let's take a look and have a little bit of discussion about that silo. Quite disappointingly, there's been a large group of um, buzzards that I was really hoping to get to introduce. Um, Stephanie actually was making some really great um, jokes because there were three of them and they reminded us of the three stooges. But for some reason, uh, those turkey, the turkey vultures did not get my memo to be sure to be here today so that we could look at them. Well, Daniel and I are going to head under the shade of these beautiful pecan trees and talk about that silo. so much nicer under here. When a rat just ran under the tree, but that's not exactly something exciting to videotape. All right. So let's talk about this silo in front of us. This is a stave silo. <clears throat> it is made out of concrete. Stave silos were often made out of metal or wood or concrete in tightly connected bands to make them airtight. Now, the reason they made these silos airtight so that they could store silage, mostly corn, in here for future cattle consumption. When they would store the silage in here, it would actually ferment. And no, the farmers were not making beer out of the corn. They were letting the corn ferment so that it would have a higher nutritional value for the cattle. Not only was the silo, not only was the silo built in this location for convenience to feeding the cattle, it was also very close to the railroad track for easy loading and unloading. This silo was part of the cave farm, and the cave farm was on this property during the 30s and the 40s. The cave family had parcels of land set out for the sharecroppers. I happen to have a really great out, so let me bring out my photograph. Thanks so very much to, the, to my fellow educators. They made, made me aware that we have an amazing photograph. So I'm going to try to make sure that the glare doesn't get it. This is a photograph taken um, in the early 40s of that very silo that we're looking at. The young lady you see sitting on top of a tractor is Carolyn Cave, one of the daughters of the family that owned the land. She's now Carolyn Black. She's obviously been married married since then, but that is Carolyn Cave sitting on a tractor right next to the stave that we are looking at today. I always think it's, it's really nice to be able to see um, representation of what something looked like back in the day compared to what it looks like now. The stave isn't being used um, for any type of silage, and as a matter of fact, the Nature Conservancy has approached us about possibly turning this into a habitat for the Mexican free-tailed bat, as their habitat has been um, greatly damaged by urbanization. I'm going to put my photos back in my backpack. We're going to head on out. Because although we've seen a lot, of great, a lot of great things today, we still have a lot to look at. So we're going to head back out from under the shade of these wonderful trees. And we're going to go look, and I know I told you, almost every one of my Texas wildflowers tends to turn into my favorite one. But um, this one is it. It is my number one favorite. It's right here on to the left. I love this plant for many reasons. Number one, it has a fantastic name. It's called Hairy Vetch. Um, vetch is, a, again, like that white clover that we talked about, an incredibly beneficial plant for its environment. It's a great nitrogen fixer. It's a great pollinator attractor. It also has legumes. And I'm going to try to get in here. 
you're going to be seeing my hands in here, and I'm going to see if I can try to find some of the edible legumes that's in this crop of hairy vetch, if I can find any. There's all sorts of other plants going on in here, so I might not be able to find one. Let's see. I don't see any pods. It may be a little bit early in the season because I'm not seeing any of the pods forming yet. But it is an excellent, like I said, soil stabilizer. And um, like the white clover, it fixes nitrogen out of the air. And it is turned over as a living compost or green mulch in many sustainable agricultural fields. Hairy vetch, one of my favorites. All right. And by the way, if you haven't figured out, hairy vetch also happens to be one of Daniel's favorites. Now, how many of you have heard of the beautiful blooming dogwoods of East Texas? Probably most of you, but did you know that North Central Texas, we have our own native dogwood too. And we're about to come up on it on the left. It is the rough leaf dogwood. Rough leaf dogwood is a fantastic capstone plant in, in any native landscape. It produces hard white fruit that is food for over 40 species of bird. It also <laughs> attracts jumping spiders, yay! Um, when I was here just a couple of days ago preparing for this, I counted four species of, of bee. There were two different species of dragonflies, so a lot of different pollinators um, use this plant as it, their food source. I also learned something from Linda Dunn, so I'm going to take a leaf. Oh, you must, oh, he's got another common bluet damselfly hanging out on the rough leaf dogwood. I've also got a couple of different bees buzzing around. I'm seeing a western honeybee buzzing around, and there's a mason bee flitting out over there too. I'm going to take a leaf off of here. Linda Dunn was just showing this to me just it was telling me about this, is if you take a rough leaf dogwood leaf and you tear it, you're going to see these little threads, and it's hard to see how it almost, see those little silken threads? I don't know if it's, can you see those? And that really is an extra hint. Oh, I got a little spider hanging off, so let me get him. I don't want to kill any spiders during my, that'd be horrible to kill a spider on live, on live feed. So you can see that leaf. So I'm going to break it again so that you can see those little strands. See those little strands connecting it? It's a really good diagnostic tool if you don't have the flowers to help you identify that this is rough leaf dogwood. Oh, he's like, one more chair. Okay, and thank you so much, Linda, for teaching me this because I had no idea. Sacrificing this poor leaf. There we go. Now you can see those strands I'm talking about. See? And then they're going to come apart. They Very silken strand. Almost it's like there's a spider web inside the leaf. So I'm going to have to do some research on that leaf structure. All right. Well, we've looked at, we've seen the wetland, and we've had a pretty good look at some of the blackland prey, and we're also seeing there is a beautiful pond hawk dragonfly that was just popping up on the top. Nice. All right. We're going to head over this way, and now you're going to get your first look at the central section of the wetland. Off to the left, you see all those green plants, and you're thinking to yourself, it looks like they're floating, Carol. That's because they are. That is one of the um, hydrophytes or aquatic plants that the water district has put in, and those are the native American water lotus. Beautiful flower pods later this summer. I have to tell you, if you come in about June, I just wish we could get Monet to come back because beautiful paintings could be done from how beautiful those floating flowers are. All right, we're about to head into the bottomland hardwood forest area, and I am going to take a, just a moment right here to, 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 do my, to do my public service announcement of how you should be prepared to go on a hike, especially a wooded hike like that. I have on good shoes, all right? I've got long pants. I have myself long sleeves. I have my backpack, and in my backpack I have spare water. I have a first aid kit. And I have um, insect repellent 
and my video and my videographer has a GPS. The last thing you need to have is a stick. Um, uh, Linda Dunn calls this the scat stick because that way if you find some scat you're not having to use your fingers to tease it apart and find out what's going on. I tend to like to use a stick this long so that I can point out certain vines for all of you because I'm not going to put my hands on poison ivy to show you what it is. So we're going to head out to this area but the first question I have for you is does it look like I am standing on an abandoned railroad track? Because I am. This was built by the Texas and New Orleans Railroad back in the 1870s. In the 1920s, it was converted into a seven-mile tram by the Bodark and Southern Railroad. Got to get all those straight. And on that seven-mile tram, they transported granite and other expensive building materials from Kaufman County all the way to the Trinity River where it could be transported. As a matter of fact, the beautiful marble that is on the, or marble and, Aust and granite that is on the Austin Capitol building was transported on this very railway. The other thing that you might be quite familiar with is the beautiful Galveston seawall. And again, those stones were carried on this very railroad track down to Galveston via the Trinity River. Now, I am quite lucky because I happen to have a couple of artifacts that I'm going to share with all of you. Last fall, after a particularly heavy rain, I decided to take a hike through here. And because of that rain, I saw something metal sticking out of the ground. Um, thank goodness I had my stick with me because I excavated a railroad tie. Now, I can't tell you whether this is an original 1870s railroad tie or if this is from the repurposing and updating back in the 20s. Either way, this is either a 100 or significantly more than 100 year old railroad tie. And, and like the picture of Carolyn Cave, I love having a connection to the past. And so uh, this is definitely a treasured artifact that we do keep at the Wetland Center. Hmm? All right, the other artifact I have, I recently gained just this past December. Again, we had a visitor that was coming through here, and the visitor said that because it had been a heavy rain, they saw something metal sticking out of the ground, and they unearthed this artifact. Um, thanks to my husband, who has been around horses his whole life, he has identified this for me as a roll bar buckle for a saddle. So whether this was a saddle that possibly the sharecroppers were using all the way back in the 40s, or whether this um, is even older than that, I'm unsure. But again, it's one of those fantastic artifacts that helps connect um, an area that we are today with what it used to be uh, back um, a long time ago. All right, I'm going to put all my belongings back in my backpack. We're going to head out onto the trail. wondering if it's going to rain on us. And there was a beautiful northern cardinal that just jumped into the uh, into that rough leaf dogwood, but he's already out of view. Ah, oh, can anybody hear those frogs? Cricket frogs, excellent. All right, well, let's head on into this amazing bottomland hardwood forest. Now, I told you how important it is to be well prepared for a hike. And so I feel obligated that I need to point out something that could really spoil your hike, which is not the beautiful dragonflies that just caught Daniel's eye. It is this plant right here, my friends, and that is poison ivy. Poison ivy can be a thin vine. It can be a bush. It can be a tree. I think that most people make the mistake of thinking that they only need to worry about poison ivy down on the ground. Keep in mind, poison ivy can wind up a tree, and you're unaware that you're walking through brush, wiping it away from your head, and that poison ivy is above your head. So, do be quite careful about it. Wearing sleeves and protection is the best way to keep yourself safe. A few little details about the poison ivy. The roots and vines have hairs on them, so it makes them a little bit easier to find during dormancy. It only takes one nanogram of, oh, now don't you spoil it and look at those spittle bugs. That's later on. You just cover that leaf back up. See? Mm -mm -mm. Don't ever, now everybody's got 
high hopes because we're going to talk about spittle bugs and Linda's going to be super excited because now, spoilers, there are spittle bugs out here with us. Um, the Urushile oil can last for five years on solid surfaces in fabric. So keep that in mind if you're like me and you go to thrift stores because you literally could buy something that someone else wore in po poison ivy. The word Urushile comes from the Japanese word Urishi, which means lacquer. Believe it or not, a four ounce container of Urushile oil is enough to give every man, woman, and child on the planet Earth the poison ivy rash. Fun fact that I learned last night, goats can eat poison ivy without any ill effect. Not only that, the milk that they produce does not have a discernible amount of Urushile oil in it. So you could very well be eating fantastic gourmet goat cheese like myself, and there could be possibly um, a non-dangerous level of the Urushile oil in it. Well, since he's talked about those spittle bugs, let's go ahead and talk about them because there's another couple of examples because, boy, they're everywhere. So let's talk about that because someone's been spitting in our forest. <clears throat> spittle bugs, also known as frog hoppers, are a, a, fantastic little, a fantastic little insect. The only life stage of the grass of the frog hopper that actually produces the spittle is the nymph. And they're actually producing that spittle, not unlike a toddler. They are eating and sucking the plant juices out of it, but they're not exactly clean eaters. So they produce a lot of foam while they're sucking those plant juices out of the, out of the plant. Uh, the, be very careful, there's poison ivy really close to that spittle bug, by the way. The damage that the spittle bug nymphs do to the plants is not um, endangering of the plant's life. It's just cosmetic damage, so there's no reason to do anything to, uh, to get rid of any of the spittle bugs. All right, we're going to head on. We've got several more plants to look at out here as we walk along. So we know we've got poison ivy and we know the old statement, right? Leaves of three, let it be. And that's a pretty good guide, but I'll tell you, there are some other vines out there that might have that similar appearance. So let's talk about this plant right here. You might be going, wait a minute, there's one, two, three leaves. That's no good, but wait a minute, do you see all the prickles? on the stems and on the leaves, that is wild dewberry. <clears throat> Close cousin to our cultivated blackberries. The fruit is much smaller, um, considerably tarter, but I have made many a tasty dewberry pie in my past. Another way to really know if when you're in a, an area and you see these berries um, blooming, if they're already turning pink or even a bit of, of dark red or black this early in the spring, most likely they are dewberries because they ripen much earlier than the cousin blackberries. All right, we're going to head on and look at this beautiful plant. Years ago, I used to think that this was a dandelion that had gone mad. This is actually not a dandelion. <clears throat> this is called sow thistle. And when you look at it, it kind of looks like half thistle, half dandelion. Um, it is a very beneficial native plant. It also happens to be a, a healthy, health, healthy medicinal herb. You can grind up the leaves and the, and the, and the flowers and make a treatment to treat diarrhea. If you want to break the stem in half and get out the latex in the stem, that sap is an excellent treatment for warts. All right. At? Oh my goodness, we've got ourselves a beautiful pennant dragonfly. Ooh, be very careful, there's poison ivy right there. Let me lower it. <laughs> Because Daniel's had his hand somewhat next to a poison ivy, the last good words of advice I'll give you is that washing your, your body thoroughly with Dawn Blue dish detergent is the best way to break that Urushile oil. And he'll definitely be washing his hands when he's done. All right. 
Now, if I asked you to now, we're going to look for some bees, how many of you would start looking up in the trees looking for a beehive? You know what? You wouldn't be looking in the right place, my friends, because did you know 70% of bees actually nest in the ground? And right here, we have got ourselves a large collection of ground bee nests. Native, native ground nesting bees are solitary. That means each female has her own nest, but they are considered to be gregarious nesters, which means that an individual bee controls this nest, an individual bee controls that nest, but they enjoy and prefer the company of each other. These native bees are not aggressive. As a matter of fact, the males of the species do not even have stingers, and the females will not sting you unless you actually handle them. Now, when we were here yesterday, oh, there's quite a few bees up ahead of us. So this particular area, either the bees are, are, are still being very calm, and they're not out. But as we walk forward, we're going to see there's quite a few bees. Here's like three or four of them right here. And I know they're really hard to capture on video because they move a lot. But there you go. You can see those native ground nesting bees. going to head back over because I do have two more vines to look at just because poison ivy can't get all the attention so I'm going to try not to crush a bunch of bees that's not very nice of me going to come back over here and we're going to take a look at this vine right here this particular vine is often mistaken for poison ivy but let's count these leaves one two three four five clearly not poison ivy this is Virginia creeper does not cause any rashing and it is in the grape family all right I'm saving my last my last fantastic green vine here. Um, one of my personal favorites, and this is called Greenbrier. Now, how do you know this is Greenbrier? Let's take a look. Serious thorns all the way up the spine, and look at these tendrils. Do you see that tendril right there? And right there, do you see those tendrils? See those? Right there. If, that, if you see a vine and it has tendrils and has thorns, my friends, absolutely, it is Greenbrier. Now, I know when you look at this leaf right here, it doesn't exactly look appealing. And I'm going to flip it over. I'm going to get my little spider for you to go back. Look, even it, has, it even has those little um, prickles on the backs of the leaves. I know it doesn't look appetizing, but this plant is completely edible. You can steam the fresh shoots like this and the leaves like asparagus. In the late summer and fall, this vine produces white berries that have their own gelling properties, not unlike a cranberry, so that you can make jams and jellies. And they have a very starchy tuber that you can boil like potatoes. Now, I'm going to, normally we, we agree, Daniel and I agree that we weren't going to back up. However, I found some dewberries that are ripening and turning red. So I'm going to try not to crush a couple of hundred ground bees. <laughs> so that we can show them because I talked about how the fact that they ripen really early I'm going to get this green briar out of the way and now you can see those two dewberry that are already turning red yummy they do take more sugar if you're making pies just just FYI or just put ice cream on top of the pie all right well we have made it to the point of the bunkers pond trail I just feel bad I don't want to crush a bunch of bees <laughs> we've made it to the part of the pond trail that um, I decided we would stop and then we'll continue this trail on two weeks from today when we go ahead and go through the thicket we'll go past Bunker's Pond we're gonna look at an old abandoned bridge and we're also going to hopefully keep our fingers crossed see some kingfisher habitat and yes my friends we will be seeing the East Fork of the Trinity River